Well, I'm a mind reader. <laughs> Did you know that? I am a mind reader. I can read the mind of God. God has given to us his word, and his word is his mind. And so I've been reading his word and discovered that I'm a mind reader. Now, I can't read your mind, and I can't read others' minds, but I can certainly read God's mind, and I've been reading it. And I just came across a wonderful, tremendous, glorious verse. And I want to be able to share it with you. But first, let me thank you for tuning in. And for those of you who have expressed the blessings that you've received from tuning in to some of the sermons that I have brought, and I'm so glad for that. It really encourages me. In fact, it makes me want to continue to keep on keeping on. I just got a call today and asked by some people if I would consider doing what they call uh, podcasts. I think that's what they call it. And so I'm looking into that and probably maybe would take their suggestion and do that as well as these messages on YouTube. But anyway, I'm just thank thankful that I have this opportunity to take what I've read in God's mind put it in my mind and translate it into your mind so that you can rejoice with God's mind in your mind as well. How about that? And then also, I want you to know that I'm especially thankful for those of you who take the time and just comment about some of the things that the Lord has done in your heart and in your mind through the preaching and teaching of his word on this particular channel from this particular preacher. And to be very honest with you, I'd love to hear from more of you. I would like to be able to have you write me, drop me a note. <clears throat> I give you my address there on the news flash. If you have not yet looked at that, look on that on the YouTube channel and you'll get the address as to where you could actually drop me a line. And possibly if the Lord should lead you, as I've said before, uh, this ministry and my ministry particularly is uh, going to have to be financed. And so if you should happen to have a gift uh, that you would like to share with me, you can mail that as well. I don't do it for that, but it would certainly come in handy if the Lord should lead. So thank the Lord for that opportunity. Look on the news flash, get the address, and let me hear from you. Now, I'm going to be traveling some and preaching some, so some of the sermons uh, may be uh, even off, uh, even in the car or in a motel room or something, but I'll try to stay in touch with you with some sermons that God gives to me uh, to help you out. Now today, I've been reading, uh, I've, re I've read through the Bible again this year, and I'm going to continue to read it and read it again this year, <clears throat> two or three times, four times maybe this year through its entirety. But here's what I want you to know. I came across this verse and I really want to share it with you and see if it will not bless you as it blessed me. And when I receive a blessing from the word of God, and if I can continue to be able to relate it to you as well and let it be a blessing to you, I want to do that. It's found in the book of Isaiah and it's found in chapter number 49. Isaiah 49, and this of course, God speaking to his people Israel but it also applies to us because all scripture is given by inspiration. In other words, any scripture can be applied to us personally. And so I'm going to apply this verse to us today as well, as I've already applied it to myself. Now, here it is. Watch this. If you have your Bible, open it there to Isaiah 49. Then drop down into verse number 16. And let me read it. Isaiah 49 verse 16. And here's what it says. Behold. Now that word behold, as I've discussed in another message on this channel, means stop and steadily gaze upon what's coming. Behold. Look steadfastly. Look intently. And here's what God says to behold. Watch what it says. Behold. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Wow. Did you hear what God just said? 
steadily gaze upon this. Behold, I, God says, have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is an awesome passage of scripture. I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. This brings us to a portion of scripture that I am convinced is very touching and especially very touching to this heart of mine. Now, as you know, if, if you were to read that whole passage in its context, Israel had left God in deep apostasy, off into sin. They were living in idolatry and wicked sin. Israel had refused at this point in time to hear God, even through his prophets, Isaiah being one of them. They refused to hear him. They were living in their apostasy and their sin. But Israel now, as we read this, and in its proper setting, wants to return to her God. And so Israel prays in verse number eight, and listen to what it says. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. So they had prayed, and God is saying, I've heard you. I have heard you and have heard your prayer. Then God rejoices with Israel, return is their return, and gives them great promises as he does through verses 10 through 13. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to express all the promises here because I want to get right to the heart of the passage of Scripture that I'm dealing with. But you need to take the time and realize God heard Israel pray from the depths of their apostasy, their idolatry, and their sin. And in, 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 in the change of that, then God says, I've heard your prayer, and here's what I'm going to promise you. And he makes these promises. Now, Israel, after hearing these promises, can't believe that God would not forsake and forget them after all that they had done. Now, that points to you and me. That points to you and me that we do some things every once in a while that we wonder, did we commit a sin or uh, did we trans, uh, transgress and trespass against God so much? Is he even going to listen to me? Maybe he's just pushed me aside and forgotten about me. But here's what, the, the, this is God confirming the question in verses 15 and 16. And verses 15 and 16 says, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. In other words, look what God is saying. A woman may forget her own sucking child before I would ever forget you. And God is helping Israel to realize, yes, you've gone into apostasy. Yes, you've, you've gone into idolatry. Yes, you've committed wicked sin. But I want to compare this to you, God says. A woman, a mother, may give birth to a pri precious prized child and even be nursing that child and it's possible, even though it almost sounds impossible, that a mother could forget her child. And then God reminds Israel. But even as strong as the relationship between the mother and the child is, and she may forget, but I will not forget you. I will not. Now, have you ever wondered, has has the Lord forgotten you? Has the Lord forgotten maybe that you're carrying the burdens that you're carrying? Have you ever wondered that maybe God is off in distance somewhere and doesn't really care? I've been looking over this uh, this uh, uh, past life of mine and 
all of those different ones that I've pastored and I've uh, looked at them and I've counted all the burdens and the heartaches and the sorrows that sat before me when I preached. And even now, I don't know who's all listening and I do not know all the burdens and the sorrows, but I know I'm talking to somebody that has them. And I realize that I'm just a preacher, but I know most of the time that people are going through some heartaches and troubles. Now you'll think of this. Think of the little old lady that has lost her husband and she's living by herself in widowhood. And sometimes she wonders, does anybody love me? Does anybody care? Have, have, has my, even some of my own children, have they forgotten that I even live and I'm existing? I'm telling you, sometimes we get to the place where we wonder if anybody even really cares. I got good news for you. Based on the scripture I have just read, moms can forget their sucking child, but even though we might be in a position and in a state of confusion or even feeling like we've been abandoned by God, God said, I'll never forget you. And the reason why I won't forget you, I have written you on the palms of my hands. Now watch this. And by the way, I was walking through the hospital and I heard uh, a hollering and a crying out. And I went to the door of the hospital room and stopped. And in that hospital room was a little old man hollering. And as I looked inside that room, that little old man, he had no leg. It had been amputated. He had no eye because it had also been removed. And the truth of the matter is he had no friends. And they... They even probably lay there in a hospital bed wondering, does even the doctors and the nurses care? And so I'm able to go in and take the Bible and tell them, you know, you're not alone. There is a God who created you and God who loves you and God who knows all about you. And if you become aware of him and know him and trust him, he'll be your ever abiding companion. And so led the man to Christ. I'm saying there are people in rest homes like that, rest, uh, older people in rest homes like that. There are people that are shut-ins in their own homes like that. There are servicemen that are away from their families and their homes and their churches and distant lands that are like that. And you wonder if folks in your own home church even care about you at times. But I got good news for you. I'm thinking right now there is somebody, and you need to know who it is, that really does know you. And he's watching you. He has an all-seeing eye that he can watch everything that's going on. And I believe right now, probably, the Lord is speaking here of this mother's love at its purest, its strongest, and its best. And he's saying to us, here's a mother's love. She's given suck to her child, her newborn. And it's more possible for that mother, for that child, and the ties that they have together to be broken than to have me, your creator, your God, your savior, to ever forget you. And the reason why I cannot forget you is because of what's in my hand. And I can almost see that God has his hand and his fist clenched. And if he opens it, out would fall some papers or out would fall something. That, but no, no, that's not what it is. When he opens his hands, we marvel as to what he told us, that our names are written in the palms of his hand. I mean that mighty hand, when it unclasps, it's not going to lose papers and it's not going to have written things flutter to the ground. And no drops of ink are going to be smeared or blotted out when he opens up his hand. Nor do we see our names carved on wood or stone. But thank God we see when he opens his hands and tells us about those hands that there are engraved on those hands our names. Listen to that verse. Listen to it. Behold. 
Look steadfastly, in other words. I have graven thee, not held thee in paper form or in ink form. I have engraven, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, and they are continually before me. Continually. In heaven, even in now, God has our names on his hands. Now, what does that say? Here's what it says. Our names are engraved on his hands shows that our Father remembers us. Our hands or his hands that have our names engraved on the palms shows that our Father remembers us. Can I give you a little bit of an illustration here? I have probably mentioned it before, but sometimes we forget some of those things that are mentioned. But my mom divorced my real dad when I was two years old, and so I never got to know my real dad until later when I found out I even had a real dad. I was raised by a stepdad and did not know that my mom had been divorced from my real dad, but I found out later, and I'll tell you that story again sometime. But when I finally got to meet my real dad, when my uncle found me and going to Bible college in Denver, Colorado, and paid the expense for me to go see my real dad, who I did not know I even had, and then called my mom and was convinced that I did have. But I had not heard from him because he did not know where I was. I was he was in Illinois. I was in Montana with my stepfather and my real mother. But my real father did not know where I was. Since I was only two when he left, he knew, of course, that I existed, that I lived, that I, he had a son, but he did not know where I was. But after I got to meet him, get this, what a great reunion it was, unbelievable. Here I was studying for the ministry. He had been saved. He was a deacon in the church and so forth uh, at that particular time. But here's what I want you to understand. What a blessing. He took me around and showed me numbers of places, even where the family had lived. And he showed me places where my grandparents had lived and all. And then he took me down to his job where he worked in a heating and air conditioning factory. And when he took me down there, he said, come on, Dean. He said, I want to show you back here in my back office. And he took me back in the back office. And when we got back there, he had a desk and he pulled out the drawer. And when he pulled out the drawer, there were some papers in the drawer. And he said, I'm going to show you something that I have to keep covered because he said, I don't want my present wife to ever be hurt by what I'm going to show you. And he took the covers off of a picture. The covering, some, some other papers were on top of a picture. And when he took those other papers off and the picture was revealed, you know what it was a picture of? It was a picture of me, my brother, and my sister. I was just a two-year-old boy. My brother was a five-year-old boy, a six-year-old boy, and my sister was a five-year-old girl. And they were in that picture. And he looked up at me with tears, tears in his eyes he said, Dean, I did not know where you were, but I've had this picture in my desk. And he said, nearly every day, I would take these papers off and I would look at your picture and I would remember that you're my son. I don't know about you, but that did something for me. I had an earthly father who would not forget me, even though he not, did not know where I was. He would not forget me. And this is exactly what God is trying to get us to see. Now, we may have committed some sins like Israel had. We may have done some things that were terrible. We may have, may have created some kind of a, a separation between us and God at a particular time. But God said, I want you to know I'm not going to forget you. And the reason why I'm not going to forget you is I have you engraven on the palms of my hands. 
I have your name there. That's what it says in verse 16. Behold, I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. You see, as much as my father that had my picture had been the one that was responsible for my birth, he was not to forget me. But I have another father who's in heaven, who's responsible for my second birth. And regardless of what I've done, regardless of where I've gone, and regardless of what I've ever committed, I have a father that has engraven me upon his hands, and he'll never forget me. I mean to tell you, that is the most awesome and most wonderful thought I have seen in, in many, many uh, types of scripture. I mean, it's just great. The Lord said a mother might forget her, her, her child, but I'm not going to forget you because I got your graven on my hands. We sometimes forget. I mean, a few years ago, I told you this story in another message a long time ago, but there, that's a real true, genuine story where a serviceman, a man in the military, and he was sent off to war. And he had said goodbye to his beautiful wife and his young little baby girl, his daughter, and he left off to go to war. Well, time passed, and soon there were no more letters from him to her or her hers was coming back to her that he would, she would send. So she had no contact at all with him for a good while. And then after a while, she decided that she's going to contact all the officials and find out if they could tell her what's happened to her husband. But they could not locate him. They could not locate his name or anything that happened to him. And here's her, her husband her daughter's father. And so she waited, and as a good Christian would, she would pray, and she worried, and she would cry. And soon it was days that went by, and weeks went by, and months went by, and past was, was soon, and soon it, it was years had gone by. And it was during the release of the POWs, remember that? That this man that had been lost and separated from his wife and his child for all these years. As one of the POWs, he was released. And when he was released, the first thing he did was come to his home. And he walked up to his door. He rang the doorbell of his own house. And there came to the door a beautiful teenage girl who had just been a baby when he left. And this teenage girl came to the door and this soldier, this POW, this dad, when she opened the door said in question, Janie? She said, yes, who are you? He said, Janie, I'm your dad. Janie, I'm your daddy. You don't remember me. And what had happened is the wife had remarried since her husband was considered to be dead. And they had forgotten him. The husband had been forgotten. The father had been forgotten. And God says to us, I'll never let that happen because I'm engraving your name on my hand, right on the palms of my hand, and I'll never forget you. What an encouraging, comforting security is that God who gave us the birth, the new birth, engraved our names on his hands. God does not forget us. Children may forget their parents, Parents who may have walked the floor with them and clothed them and fed them and cared for them and wept for them and spent money for them, trained them. And children today maybe never even remember their parents hardly. They never write to them. They never say, I love you. They never visit them and they forget them. And sometimes even children place their parents in an old age home. I'm saying parents can forget. Friends can forget. 
Friendships are forgotten and children forget. And I'm afraid sometimes I've been guilty of what I'm preaching that I have forgotten. But I don't want to because I'm now remembering what God has said. Someone was a friend when I needed it. Someone was a friend to you when you needed it. But you've forgotten that friend, haven't you? I mean, God does not forget. He has graven our names on the palms of his hands, and he has not forgotten. He not only forgets, but God loves me enough to put my name on the palm of his hand. His love is shown by where he put my name on his hand. And it's always before him. It's like a girlfriend and a boyfriend. You've seen them. They've written their boyfriend's name on their hand or they've written their girlfriend. Why? Because it's always before them. They can see the name of their girlfriend or boyfriend because their hand is always before them. That's what God has done. We place our pictures of those we love where we can always see them. We put place them on the walls. And that's what God meant when he said, here, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, and thy walls are continually before me. In other words, like right behind me is a picture. It's a picture of me and my wife. And I always see that picture. Why? Because it's on the walls. And that's what God's saying, that your name are engraven in my hand, and you're always on the walls before me. You're always before me. What a great truth. So number one, he doesn't forget me. Number two, he loves me enough to place me where he can always see me. And number three, thank God for this. It gives me security because he is not just holding it in a piece on a piece of paper. He has literally engraved it. It's not tattooed. It's carved. It's engraved. It's cut. It's indelible. It cannot be erased. It's right there in the palms of his hands. That means I cannot fall out of his hands because I'm cut into his hands. Our name is there to stay. I'm telling you now, the truth of the matter is we've got to remember that God has placed us engraved on his hand. That's why he said this in John chapter 10, and no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Why? Because we're engraved in his father. That's in the New Testament. You cannot pluck them out of my father's hand. That shows then that since I'm in his hand, he remembers me. He doesn't forget me. He loves me because it's always before him. And I have security and I can't be lost out of his hand. And then watch this. There's another reason why he placed our, our names on the palms of his hands. It helps to remind me that I have been atoned for. Why? My name is on his hand. It's not on his foot. It's not on his hip. It's not on his back. It's not on his thigh. It's not on his leg. It's not on his forehead. It's in his hands. My name is in his hands. But wait a minute. There's something else in his hands. My name is there, but there's something else in his hands. What is it? The scars of the cross that says that my name is right there by where he paid the price to buy me. And that's why he has engraved my name by the very wound that it cost him to buy me. And so it's very special to show me that I have been atoned for because my name is by the nail pierce of his hand that paid the price for me. I mean, the scars are in heaven right now, which means my name is by the scars in heaven on his hands right now. My name is right now on the throne of God in the hands of Jesus, and that's a promise from the word of God. Ask Thomas. He saw the scars in the palms of his hands, and God says, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand because we are engraved. And so our names that are born again and saved and have God as our Father, we are already on the throne by our names. What a truth. My name is graven there. 
I mean, it reminds Jesus and me of the price that he paid for me. Thank God. Let me close with this illustration. A true one actually happened. Like most families, children grow up. And in this particular time, there was a mother who had lost her husband. And she was raising a little tiny baby girl by herself. And while she was raising that girl, she had to rent something because of poverty of a little apartment where it only had two bedrooms, one for the mother and one for the little girl. And in the middle of the night, one night, fire broke out in that little apartment. And that mother woke up smelling the fire coming from the room of her little girl. And when she ran into the hall and looked into the room, the whole room where the little girl was, was engulfed in flames. Smoke and fire was billowing. And that little, that little girl was on that bed and that bed was on fire. And that mother ran into that room and grabbed that little girl up in the blankets and as best she could, found her way back out in the hallway and down the stairs and outside and put the little girl down on the grass. And the little girl had burned some, but the mother had burned terribly. And the mother raised that little girl. Now get this. I want you to get it. And that little girl became a teenager and a teenager that was popular, beautiful little girl that grew up to be beautiful. And in her school, she became the head of the cheerleaders. And the other cheerleaders had cheerleaders clubs where they would always have parties and cheerleading at homes practicing. And one day the mother asked the little, the daughter that was a cheerleader, why she didn't ever have a party at their house. Why did she didn't bring her friends there? And that girl who did not know the story that I just told you about what her mother did, that girl looked at her mother and said, I'll tell you why, Mom. I'm going to tell you why I don't bring my friends over here. Look at your hands, all gnarled and crippled and burnt, and I don't want to be embarrassed in front of my friends with, with your ugly hands. And that mother's heart broke. She said, sit down a minute, honey. And the teenage girl sat down and the mother said, let me tell you a story. One day when you were a little baby and the fire broke out in the house, your bed was on fire and you were about to be burned. And I ran in and took those burning clothes and those burning blankets and I wrapped you up in them. And as I was carrying you out to save your life, my hands are like this because they were burned, saving your life. They were burned like this. And I'm sorry that you're ashamed of them, but I used them to save you. And the daughter looked at her mother and said, Mommy, I did not know. I did not know that you used those hands that were burnt so bad to save me. I did not know. And that girl stood up and went over to her mom and hugged her and said, oh, mama, I'm so sorry. And she took her mama's hands and kissed them and said, thank you for the hands that saved my life. And ladies and gentlemen, when we get to heaven, and we see the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. And we'll see our names engraved by the scars that saved us. I believe we too will kiss the hands of Jesus and thank him for saving us. Those scars that have our names by them. Tell us, number one, he forgets, he doesn't forget us. Number two, he loves us. Number three, they're engraved so they're secure. But number four, it shows 
that he paid the price to save us. I read it and I'm done. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thank God for the nail-scarred hands and thank God that our names are written, engraved on those hands. God bless you folks. Love Jesus today. I pray